Hi everybody, it's Mr. Paula. In this video, we're going to be discussing the characteristics of living things. All right, the first characteristic that we're going to discuss is the fact that all living things are made of cells. Now, some organisms are single-celled organisms. There are other organisms that contain many cells. So let's take a look at some examples of cells. The first cells that we're going to be looking at are the ones in the center, the ones which look like purple blobs. These are animal cells. Uh, these are actually cells uh, taken from the inside of a person's mouth. They're cheek cells, and we can see that they have a, an irregular shape because they do not have a cell wall. Uh, now, the next cells that we're going to take a look at are plant cells. Uh, these are cells that are taken from an onion. Uh, we can see that the plant cells have a cell wall. They have a much more regular shape. And the last uh, example that I've put on uh, this slide is a moose. Now, a moose is an organism that has many cells. So we would call this a multicellular organism. So we have some organisms that have many, many, many cells. We have other organisms like bacteria or protists, which contain only a single cell. Another key characteristic of living organisms is that they display organization. This means that they have structures which are going to perform specific functions for that organism. So let's take a look at some examples of this. Uh, so I've selected three different living things, a whale, a crab, and my dog, Kenzie. Uh, so the whale has a tail. That's one of its specialized structures. The crab has a shell. And uh, Kenzie, my Cairn Terrier dog, has ears. Now, Cairn Terriers were bred to uh, hunt in rock piles called cairns. And uh, because they couldn't see their prey, they had to have very well-developed hearing in order to find where those vermin were. So these ears are very, very organized structures which allow for the cairns to be good hunting dogs. Uh, now, the crab's shell is a protective covering. And it doesn't protect crabs from all predators, but it does protect the crabs from many things which would eat the crab. The final structure that I've highlighted is the tail of a whale. Now, the whale's tail allows the whale to swim very quickly in an aquatic environment, and this helps the whale to avoid being eaten by predators. The next trait that we're going to look at is the fact that living things grow and they show development. Uh, so here, what we're seeing are a number of examples of different living organisms. This is a Sitka spruce. I took this picture in Washington State a number of years ago. Now, the spruce is an example of an organism that we call a producer. Producers are organisms that carry out the process of photosynthesis. They use carbon dioxide, CO2. They use water, H2O. They're going to make glucose, sugar, C6, H12, O6. They also make oxygen. Now, this started out as a really, really small tree, probably 500 to 550 years ago, but it's grown to be just this incredibly huge, massive tree uh, at a height of over 270 feet. Now, producer organisms would include also the algae that we see in the pond where the, the ducks are swimming. Now, the ducks are eating the algae, and the reason why they're eating it, they are consumer organisms. They are going to use that algae as food, and they use the carbohydrate molecules, the C6H12O6, that they ingest by eating the algae, and they use that to provide power for their body. And they can use that energy from food molecules to grow and develop, just like the tree was able to grow and develop by carrying out the process of photosynthesis. The next characteristic of living things we'll talk about is reproduction. All living things need to reproduce. So the example that I've highlighted in, uh, for this video are some mallard ducks. Uh, I took pictures of these in the pond behind my house earlier this year. And um, reproduction means that living things produce offspring. So we can see that the female duck, uh, we've seen, we see her here with her, her baby. Um, female mallards typically lay between 5 and 14 eggs in the late spring. They take about one month to hatch. About two months after hatching, they'll start to uh, fly. And uh, one of the keys for uh, ensuring future mallard uh, reproduction is wetland protection. So the next characteristic of living things that we'll take a look at is 
the fact that living things will show adaptation through the process of evolution. Now, evolution is driven by a process called natural selection. The first component of natural selection is genetic variation. Here we see two wolves. Now, when we look at the wolves, they're not identical. They're not exactly the same because each wolf has a unique set of genes, and that makes the two wolves different from each other. So they are unique individuals. Uh, the next component that we'll take a look at is the overproduction of offspring. This means that organisms will reproduce, as we discussed in that previous slide, and the overproduction of offspring. This means that offspring, like the fawn that we see being circled right here, uh, that there are many, many, many offspring that are being produced. If a species isn't doing this, the numbers of the species are likely going to be dropping, and this is a species which might be threatened or endangered. Uh, next, there's a struggle for existence. For the deer, the struggle is that it lives in the same environment as wolves, and wolves eat deer. Uh, because there is a predator-prey relationship for the deer, there is a struggle for existence because they have to avoid being eaten. So deer have evolved uh, many features which allow them to avoid wolves catching them. They run very fast. Um, they have good hearing. Finally, we have differential survival and reproduction. And we see here a hermit crab that has, again, a protective shell. Now, when organisms have structures which allow them to better survive in their environment, they're going to be more likely to reproduce. You can't reproduce if you're dead. So the crabs that have the best protective shells are going to do the best job surviving, and they're going to have more babies. And then Another characteristic of living things is that living organisms are able to respond to external stimuli. So this uh, a stimuli is an event that takes place outside of the organism. So the example that we're going to take a look at is a track and field athlete who's going to respond to the stimulus of a simulated starter pistol. The response of the athlete after they hear that starter pistol is to push out of the blocks to begin their race. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, so we see the athlete is preparing in the blocks for his race, and um, set. he's going to go oh. into the set position. We hear that starter simulated pistol, and the runner responds by beginning his race. Another important characteristic of living things is that they use energy. They have metabolism. The example that I'm highlighting here is the leafcutter ant, shown here. Now, what leafcutter ants do is they carry leaves from the forest to their underground colonies. The leaves are actually not what the ants eat. They actually use the leaves to grow a fungus, and the fungus actually is what uh, they feed to their larvae. Now, the uh, relationship that exists between the ant and the fungus is an example of mutualism because both species are being benefited. So let's take a look at some leaf cutter ants. We can see that uh, the leaf cutter ants are carrying the leaves and are going to bring these leaves to their underground colony. Uh, this video was taken in the uh, Peruvian ants. Another characteristic of living organisms is homeostasis. This means that living organisms keep internal conditions stabilized. One example of homeostasis is temperature regulation. Uh, in my classes, my students are going to be performing an experiment to model the situation where uh, an individual or person is thrown into ice water for an extended period of time. And uh, we can't put people actually into ice water. That wouldn't be a safe experiment. But what we can do is model. So we're, the model that we're using is to have uh, just one part of the body the hand submerged into ice water. So what we do is we measure the temperature of the hand before placing it into ice water by holding onto a thermometer, reading the starting temperature of the hand, and then the hand is submerged in ice water for 45 seconds. And we do different things with the hand to have different survival strategies. Once the hand has been submerged in ice water for 45 seconds, we take it out of the water, we measure the new temperature of the hand, the temperature has dropped, so we're able to determine how much body heat was lost by the hand. And we can determine then which survival strategy is going to be most effective to keep that core body temperature up for as long as possible until help can arrive to get you out of that cold water. All right, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful.